one of the major problems with shale gas exposure and shale emissions exposure is what do the chemicals do? And in order to understand what the chemicals do, we have to understand some of the fundamental toxicology of the chemicals, how they act, and the process. And so what we're going to do in this segment is to give you a, give a framework for how people evaluate chemicals, mixtures, and situations such as we're seeing in, with uh, shale gas emissions. Um, and why do we start with the toxicology? It's because there are presently plausible reports of human health effects in uh, people who are exposed to the shale gas. Uh, that we know the chemicals and physical agents are present. We know that they're present in the environment. And we know that there are pathways of exposure. Pathways of exposure are really important in understanding chemical toxicology. And there are four for the shale gas, water, air, soil, and food. So we, and we know through those pathways, people are going to be getting, getting exposed. Our problem is how do we analyze those uh, and, uh, and make the rationale part of the uh, understanding of the physician or the uh, toxicologist that's looking at it. Um, a second part of the problem is that almost all the chemicals are incompletely understood. That's not true for carbon monoxide, but it's true for many of the chemicals that we have. And the toxicity of the chemicals is not necessarily the acute toxicity you get when you're exposed to a high amount, because in the shale gas, people are exposed for moderately long periods to, to moderate concentrations, and that area has not been researched very well. So we know there's gas in the communities, and we know, we'd know, like to know how to think about it. So this uh, presentation is going to develop a framework for how to reason with those and we'll sprinkle in some examples and at the end we'll actually talk about the 12 chemicals or types of chemicals that I think are most important for us to reason. Uh, we, we do know there are health effects. Just briefly, there's breathing problems, there's asthma, COPD. Or when we go and examine patients who are individuals who have been exposed in different sites across the country, we see those effects appearing again and again. So we know that's a problem, that, that they're a problem. They also tell us, talk about intense head, head, uh, headaches, and, and that headaches tend to be with confusion in some, in some people. There's, there's a concern that there's precancerous lesions being seen in some of the people who are exposed. Uh, there, there are blood dyscrasias, including nosebleeds and increased spleen size, which may be associated with the blood, and large spleens. There are dermal rashes that we see in chemical burns appear to be in in going on, and there's sleep and stress disorders. Now part of the problem is that the people who are exposed to the, to the gas drilling uh, are also uh, stressed tremendously by the amount of light and noise that's going on, and the, just the stress for not, where they don't know exactly what's happening. Um, in order to get a sense of what we needed to talk about, we went and talked to health providers who had actually looked at patients and, and tried to identify what they were seeing and, and see if it made any rational, uh, logical links appeared. Uh, and we, we had areas of, uh, of concern. Some physicians thought they saw elevated blood pressures in children. Some said that they were uh, seeing children that failed to thrive. Uh, others reported uh, the nosebleeds and acne-like responses. And, uh, and others were just concerned that they didn't understand how to even under how to deal with the, uh, with the, uh, the, uh, the problem. So, so how do you deal with a problem like this? First, in, if you're thinking about toxic agents getting into the body, you should think about pharmacology and pathopharmacology. Uh, foreign chemicals coming into the body are basically what, what we're, we're, uh, we see when we administer drugs. It's what we see when we uh, have a toxic exposure. The toxic agents have some different characteristics, but the basic characteristics that they do uh, 
that are similar is the uptake into the body follows similar principles. The target organ where they, the chemical acts are identified in each case. You start your decision with, if you have a liver poison, you just think about the liver. You don't think about other parts of the agent. Uh, the third issue is the dose rate and what increases the dose and duration of exposure. And that's obviously the, the rate that is released from the body, the rate that is metabolized, and the way that it's distributed through the body. Those are the kinds of questions we have to find because toxic agents operate by increasing dose at a site in the body. And that's actually what you want to know. It's what's happening at the individual target organ, target tissue within the body. Uh, typically, toxic agents act by binding to things. Um, and they block normal function. An agent such as barium, for example, tends to cause calcium to decline in the, in, in the, uh, in the system, and it tends to produce uh, cardiovascular changes from calcium uh, effects. Uh, the more barium you have, the greater the effect. So, uh, and, but it's not as simple as that there's barium there. Most barium salts are not very toxic because they're not very soluble. But when they are soluble, they are extremely toxic. So it's not as enough just to know that there's barium present. You have to know something about the salt that's present. Or if you don't know it, you just need to be able to say, this is a possibility of what I'm, what I'm seeing. The, uh, but the key is to start thinking from the cellular organ or from the organ if you can get it. If you don't know the cellular site, you'd like to get to the organ that's affected and understand where that is. Where, where that is going. The, the last piece that's important uh, in the pharmacology thing is to recognize that every agent has multiple actions. We see that in drugs. It's high, you can overdose and get different actions, but the toxic chemical has multiple actions. The only one, not the only one, but the one we're principally interested in is going to be the, that agent that occurs at the lowest dose at the most sensitive target organ, because that's what we want to protect against. So our problem is figuring out what that agent is and, and, and where it goes. There are actually four basic rules in toxicology that I like to explain to people. First of all, toxic chemicals inhibit and or block uh, normal physiological processes. The thing that I tell my students is chemical toxins bring nothing to the system. You cannot make a liver act like a kidney by a toxic agent. Toxic agents operate by inhibiting things. And if you can determine what's inhibited, being inhibited, you can determine that the toxic agent is action. The, the action must follow the rational biological spectrum of disease. You damage the, an enzyme and the effects of the enzyme are, are seen later as in time. And then finally, the effects of a damaged, tish, damaged tissue may be reflected in the effects on a kidney because of the damage to the tissue. It follows the rational biological spectrum of disease. That's important for us to remember because much of the toxicology literature is high dose related and so instead of looking at the original site of action, we may be looking at some site that's two or three steps down the, down the pathway and we would like to get to the site of action. Uh, the, the fourth principle is chemicals have multiple target organs. They have multiple kinds of actions, um, but they don't have thousands of kinds of actions. They have about three or four or five. So it's not an com extremely complicated problem, but you do have to understand what the different actions would be at different levels. We have almost no interest in the high dose actions because we never see them. Uh, we also recognize though that we may see an action that's occurring in the first week or months after exposure uh, that, that we're very interested in and we neglect to realize that some actions are chronic. And that a carcinogen may be doing something very early in the exposure which you don't care to regulate about on because you know that later it's going to be producing cancer and you don't want a cancer agent in, in the environment. Um, in the same one in reproductive agents. Certain individuals are sensitive to certain problems. So the, the fetus is, uh, is a unique exposure, but in a population exposure, such as we're seeing on the Marcellus Shale, you've got to think about uh, 
the fetus because we certainly don't want to protect the adult males and not understand the fetus. Uh, the last point, which is extremely important, is that similar chemicals have similar actions. So we think about the chemicals in terms of classes of actions. If we're thinking about a volatile organic chemical or, a, or a, an aromatic amine, all of the aromatic amines act in generally the same target action in generally the same way, so that, so that that's a problem. I think about the chemicals in this order. And I think about the chemicals in this order. First, I think about the rate of exposure and uptake into the blood. The second thing I, thing I think about is what is the target organ affected? Where is it doing whatever it's going to do? The next thing I think about are what would be the signs and symptoms because the signs and symptoms are going to be reflective of a target organ that's damaged. If we see effects on the central nervous system, we're going to see cognitive central nervous system effects appear. If we see effects on the kidney, we're going to see renal effects occur. So the indication that we might have that there's a toxic agent present may be renal damage, or maybe it may be liver damage, or in terms of the skin, it may be a skin rash or skin damage, or it might be an immune effect. So those agent, those questions are the questions that we use to frame our thinking. Uh, we, we always like to know the half-life of the compound because it tells us the duration the compound is going to be in the body. And, uh, and so we also, as, in terms of half-life, we would like to know the toxicity of a chemical relative to other toxicity, other chemicals in its class. So that a chemical that is very highly toxic, and fluorides are a good example of this, some of them are not very toxic at all. Some of them are incredibly toxic. The, the range of, if we look at reference values, the range can go from um, 10 parts per million, if you want, down in terms of, of, of a hazard, down to 0.01 part per million, an extreme range. So it, it's not enough to just know what class it is. You have to know what the intensity is within the class. Uh, we would like to know the metabolites that are formed because most chemicals don't act by themselves. They are transferred into something that, that causes action, and that's going to cause us a problem when we think about the tissue damage that we see later, and we're trying to look at interactions of, of chemicals. And lastly, we'd like to look at excretory pathways. Two reasons. One, we'd like to know if it's the liver has, a, the, the kidney has an extremely high rate of blood flow. So agents that may not be toxic someplace else may be toxic to the kidney because so much is coming in so rapidly and it tends to be not lost. In terms of, age, of sites, the kidney is a high, high site on our risk. The, the other reason we'd like to know is we'd like to know what we can look for in the urine if we want to test the amount of exposures that are occurring. Uh, compounds often come out of the body in, as conjugates of sulfhydryl reactions. So that often is what we'll see. They will often come out of the body as a hydrolyzed metabolite of the, of the compound. So we need to look at those, those, sorts, of, those sorts of actions. This means that the structure activity relationships are followed exactly as they are in, in, in the pharmacology literature. Things of similar structure have similar actions and uh, the thing that changes the, is the intensity. Usually the target organ does not change, but the intensity can change. Uh, and this, as I said before, signs and symptoms of those changes are what will give us an indication of how dangerous this exposure might be in a, in a particular population. In the case of the Marcellus shale, we have a serious problem because there's a mixture of chemicals coming in. And if you can imagine a mixture of chemicals coming in where one chemical inhibits the metabolism of another chemical, then all of the reference values that we have on that chemical that's acted on are, are going to be too high because the, the duration of the compound in the body may be longer. Its ability to be excreted may be more, more uh, uh, may be less, or it could be more, but generally it's, it's less. Um, so we, we, we would like to be able to, when somebody asks us about a chemical, you'd like to ask the question, okay, do you know what the metabolism is of this chemical? Do you know what the rate of metabolism is and what the half-life is?
If you don't know that, then you're, we're on, in very dangerous territory in terms of determining what the health and safety of that chemical may be. And I'll show you that problem in a little bit. Uh, so, it's, so for the shale gas, what we have identified, as I mentioned before, is that there are four major pathways. But we'd like to concentrate this morning on two. That's the water pathway. And the water pathway, you can get exposures in four ways. From drinking the water, you can get exposure from bathing and showering in the water. You can get exposure from simply using the water for cooking or washing clothes and get it into the air. So that if we wanted to define what the relative exposure rates for those pathways are, as a rule of thumb, we assume that people drink two liters of water a day. And so whatever the content in two liters is what the dose is. Uh, but the problem is if it's used in a house, that the amount that you would inhale through showering and bathing is about the same. So you have double the exposure that, you would, that we would think about. So when someone measures a value and said, this is what the value is in drinking water, uh, and you find the value is half of that, that doesn't help you very much because you're still near the, the dangerous level. Um, the air pathway is, is an even more complicated one, but we can simplify it a bit. The, the inhalation during heavy outdoor activities or heavy indoor activities is many fold the inhalation rate during sleeping. So, so that we know that uh, people who are active are more apt to have a response. Young children running around are more apt to respond than older people. So we can, we can get that, that uh, piece off. But the most complicated part about the air pathway is that the weather system outside will determine how much will be trapped near the surface and will be possibly getting it into someone's home. It's very important to realize that factor is in the order of 10 to 20 times what we would see uh, normally. So if we drew an air sample for 24 hours and got a number like 10 parts per million, we should think about that that number could be 200 parts per million during the point in time when people are exposed. Now, the order of, of target organ effects responses um, is important to know, and we're lucky or fortunate, it depends on how you think about it, but ATSDR actually reviewed all of its data and came back and said, this is the order of tissues that appear to be damaged at Superfund sites, which are not very different from what we're looking at when there's exposure. And that, that list of values may be a good place to start when we're trying to think about how does one look at strange chemicals appearing at the Marcellus Shale. And uh, the first uh, five, or highest five organs that they found were GI experiences. So things, people were nauseous, they had GI experiences. The second was skin. They saw dermal effects. Uh, the third was sensory. They found on eye and ear and those kinds of effects from the exposures. The next they found breathing problems, inhalation problems. And the fourth one, they found energy problems. It, it looked like people were just extremely tired. And we thought they were tired because of the stress. But it actually, if, when we went in it, we could see there were actually effects on the phospho phosphorylation pathways that were being affected. So those organs tend to be ones that we were, were high on. The next most frequent effects we saw, and remember we were following up several years after the event, was, were cancer, allerg allergies, and reproductive actions. Those actions were present at these exposure things. The next we saw were neuropathies, sometimes with a delayed onset. So someone would have an exposure, several weeks, months, years later, they would show some sort of neurological kind of problems. The next two were liver injuries and, and kidney injuries, which we would expect because people have a tremendous amount of exposure. But these organ systems appear to have a great ability to compensate, so we don't see quite so much. The, the, the cardiovascular was always there, but in, in fact, we don't understand much about cardiovascular toxicology. So that probably was missed. And the last was, uh, was uh, psychological or psychosocial effects due to stress and worry. Uh, we think it's due to stress and worry, 
But the psychiatrist working with us said, you know, there may be an organic effect of a chemical doing that. Well, if we look now at the uh, Marcellus shale and, and ask, what are the exposures? And this will be a, a slide we'll put up, okay? Uh, we, we found, we, if we just went to uh, one of the sites and we've looked at, I think, in southwest Pennsylvania, we've looked at all of the data measurements at all of the sites, at least available to, to us in the English language. We found, for example, that there was a range of organics. I'll just go through them quickly for you. What, what was found at one set of drinking water sites, and they were arsenic, barium, cobalt, copper, iron, lead, manganese, magnesium, nickel, selenium, potassium, sodium, zinc, and radium. Uh, in terms of the organics that were, that were present, uh, was in alphabetical order, there was 1,3-dimethyl adamantane. There was methane, total petroleum hydrocarbons as gasoline, the general class of gasoline were found. Chlorophenol was found at high levels. Uh, bis 2 ethyl hexothalate was found. We know a little bit about phthalate toxicology. We don't know a whole lot about butyl benzyl ethyl phthalate toxicology, so we're gonna have to do some expert there. Coprolactam, phenol, and total petroleum hydrocarbons is diesel. That's a mess of compounds. If you're worried about compounds interacting with each other, you've got enough compounds that will interact with each other. So it, it turns out that we should think about the Marcellus shale exposures, not in terms of single compounds, but in terms of groups of compounds that may ha have actions upon each other. And those groups of compounds, uh, as, as a toxicologist, uh, the way we resolve that problem is we divide them into classes. We say, we're, let's think about, for example, the inorganic salts and acids, and think about them as a class. Look at the general toxicology of those as a class, and try to understand what those kinds of chemicals react to. We'll say a little bit more about that later. We have volatile organic carb, uh, hydrocarbons, short-chained and branch-chained, usually under C8. Those chemicals are very toxic. They, they're, they're very bioactive. They may not be toxic. They're bioactive, and they tend to be cleared from the body by the lung. They tend to interfere with liver metabolism. They tend to be activated to other compounds by, by exposures. The next, the next group we have are the polyaromatic hydrocarbons, the PAHs. Those are, those are things like benzene, xylene, toluene. There's the phenols. There may be some more complicated, more, more complicated uh, aromatic compounds. These compounds are a problem. First of all, they, they tend to be activated into other substances and they tend to be activated in certain tissues in unique ways. They may be activated in the lung and produce lung tissues. They may be activated in the liver and produce liver damage. So that class of compounds we'd like to think about as a group. Um, the, the, the next is carbonyls. These are the, the inorganic aldehydes, the aldehydes mixed with uh, having with a salt or something of that sort. Aldehydes tend to alkylate really well. And so we see the effects of a highly active substance that gets in the body that's alkylated and tends to continue to react. The next set of chemicals are, are odd. Carbon monoxide. Why there's lots of carbon monoxide there is probably because there's a lot of incomplete combustion present. And I would normally not even think about carbon monoxide, but there's so much there. And, and we know that the air system will tend to bioaccumulate it, so it will tend to cause the levels to be higher. And the problem with carbon monoxide is that it's cleared from the blood very slowly. So episodic exposures to carbon monoxide over several weeks could produce neurological effects simply due to the inability of the blood to carry oxygen. Um, Biocides and acrylamide are two compounds that are, they don't fit into any real class, but the shale gas process system has to control microbial uh, growth that produces sulfur in the, in, the, in the deep well. 
without that, you'll get sulfuric uh, acids forming and destroying their apparatus. So, so that biocides are used. The particular biocide that's used is, uh, turns out to be also appearing in common agents like Clorox and things like that, but at very, very low doses. But in, in the shale gas area, it's put in by the truckload. So we, and the basic problem with the one biocide that I'm gonna talk about a little bit later is that it, it is a sensitizer. So we could, in fact, at high doses, sensitize people, and then as they use cosmetics further on, they would show reactions to that, to that, uh, um, to that prior exposure. The other chemical that kind of sits out there and it gives toxicologists a lot of concern is acrylamide. Acrylamide is a delayed neurotoxin. It's put in the, in the gas. It's in the fracking process to make the water, I'm not sure it's slick or something, but acrylamide has been known since the building of the New York subways to be a severe and dangerous neurotoxicant. And acrylamide was actually found in some of the groundwater that, measurements that were, that were made, which is worrisome. Uh, the, the third class of chemicals are in, inhalable min, mineral dust, silica. We know that silica with high levels of quartz will in fact bind to the, uh, will in fact get in the lungs and produce a progressive fibrosis in, a, in workers. We, we, that's also associated with high levels of, uh, of tuberculosis in, in Vermont in early years. But when we go into the literature and look at silica and ask what would happen if a child were exposed to silica, or what would happen if silica occurred, exposure occurred to uh, somebody has CLPD, nobody knows because nobody would have ever considered exposing somebody to silica who had those diseases. So we have an agent and we have no idea what the safe level is. But if you go to people who are living in the, in the gas drilling areas, the one thing they talk about is sand. They talk about sand contaminating their dishwashers. So there's lots of silica around, and it's very high quartz, because it needs to be high quartz to do the action that's required in the compound. The last, the last class compound I would just measure is not a class, it's radioisotope, and it's radium. Radium is present, and the problem with radium is, it, is that it actually will dissolve in water and it's carried through water. So radium exposures um, are clearly something we would worry about through all three of our routes, all four of our routes that we have. And the problem with radioisotopes is we don't have to wonder about what they will do. If there's enough radium there, we will get cancers. So, uh, but those are, there aren't hundreds of classes when you do that. There's about those six classes and you probably could add one or more, or take a couple away if you wanted to. But the problem is not one of hundreds of chemicals to look at. We'll, we'll put them in these classes and try to say something about them. Uh, and generally, the VOCs we know are rapidly absorbed. They seek fat, they're slowly excreted. They, uh, they produce sensory irritation. They tend to act on the liver and they tend to act on the brain. And we can think about that as a class of chemicals that do that. Piece. We can then go into the literature if we want for specific chemicals and know with this class we should be thinking and looking for those sorts of effects. And in the patients we should be looking for evidence that that kind of thing is happening to them. Uh, with carbonyls, they alkylate proteins and phospholipids. They tend to be sensitizers. From, uh, formaldehyde is a great sensitizer. It's also a very potent carcinogen. Acetaldehydes fall into that class. If we look at the old industrial hygiene literature, we will find the effects of those chemicals in workers laid out very clearly. So we can, we can actually have a pathway to get that, that kind of information. Uh, divalent ions, things like arsenic, things like uh, lead, things like barium, things like fluoride. Divalent ions tend to act by replacing normal physiological systems in the body. Uh, inhibition of, uh, of calcium is frequently a seen, but inhibition of calcium, because that's what's happening, tells us what we need to look for 
in, in the patients that we're evaluating. We, we tend to want to, I want to, go and say, let's measure the urine and find out what they're exposed to, or let's measure the blood and find out what they're exposed to, and almost everybody will do that, including uh, I will often advise, I'm not a physician, I'll often advise people to do that. It's almost a hopeless endeavor. What you really want to do is see what, if you know the target organ, is the target organ re reacting? In some cases you can find lead, in some cases you can find cadmium, and so you shouldn't not do it, but you should recognize that's not going to be the process to the solution. You should also re recognize that although with lead we do have a, we have an antidote of sorts, most toxic chemicals there is no antidote. So there's not really much hope to search for, for the, a particular antidote of things. And, and divalent ions interact with physiologic functions like calcium. So that's what we see. And then of course, uh, we, uh, we uh, have the radioisotope problem I've talked about before. The um, reason I lay this out is because that's about it. You can't, we would like to have hundreds of things and questions we can ask. We don't, we are now working down this, this tree. And what do we get when we work down this tree? We suddenly find ourselves in the toxicology literature. Uh, and as a toxicologist, I, I find that's just wonderful. But for most other people, it's an adventure, to say the least. Toxicology studies are highly analytical and highly me mechanistic. Toxicologists are interested in the mechanisms by which agents affect things. They do not, they're moved way beyond what's the target organ or what do we need to do, or what will this do in the patient? That's not their interest. So you can plow through miles and miles of toxicology literature and not get very far. The other thing is the toxicologists tend not to worry about low doses. They want stuff they can measure, and it's got to be measured statistically. So very low dose long-term exposures haven't, haven't been done. There are people, a few paper places where they've been speculated about, and a few places you can go to look for information. One of the places I go and look for information on this is this, there really are four, is, uh, is the uh, poisoning and drug overdose that, that is available to most physicians. And you can flip back and, you can, and you'll notice when you get into this book that everything's organized by classes. And as you can look at a class, you can say, we know what the rate of onset is. We know what the target organ is. We know where to go. That's a good place to begin to, to look. If we look at looking at uh, uh, a fundamental textbook, is a book by Kasserin and Duell, which actually the people who taught, wrote that book are thinking about the chemicals in terms of the mechanisms and, for, and, and rates of, and uh, and pathways of, of action. And uh, the other place that's excellent to look in is some of the old industrial hygiene literature. There's a book called Paddy, by, written really by Dr. Irish, and I think he was probably in the middle of the last century. But Dr. Irish used case studies, so you could see what's coming off of those case studies, and sometimes it's easier to understand the problem in that sort. Uh, a, a tremendous place to look is at the Agency for Toxic Substance and Disease Liter Registry. If you can figure out what the chemical is, and you can figure out what the effects are, they will have a document on that which will again include case studies. It will include, include what people think are reference or safety levels. But actually what's really nice is they don't tell you what the American level is. They do tell you that. But they tell you what everybody else in the world thinks about it. So that gives you really, that's really helpful information. It'll take a lot of time. And because it takes so much time for us at Southwest Pennsylvania, our nurse practitioner is in the process of putting that information together in a chart so we can actually begin, we begin to look at it. Chart isn't complete, but what is complete is very helpful because what she's indicated is how is it used, what are the health effects you'll see, what does the laboratory tell you, what are the toxics, and then what environmental concerns become present. So you can actually get that sort of information from you if it's, if it's helpful. The major problem is the mixture problem. Uh, and I can't overemphasize how serious that is in trying to understand what's going on in the Marcellus Shale. The presence of one agent can increase the toxicity of another agent by several fold. There's actually a pesticide called difluorophosphate, which is relatively 
non-toxic in itself unless the least toxic pesticide present used in industry, parathion or malathion are present, and this chemical blocks their metabolism, increasing the effects of parathion and malathion by 50-fold or more. So, and that's exactly what we're seeing when we have multiple chemicals in the cellar shale. So the question is, how often do you see an interaction? Well, generally, if you put two interacting chemicals together, it's probably somewhere less than 10% of the time, but more than 1% of the time, if you, in terms of chemicals. But you can imagine if it's 1% of the time, and you've got the list that I read to you before, which is roughly 30 or 40 or 50 chemicals present, the chances that you won't have an interaction are almost zero. The chances that you will know what that interaction is are probably close to zero also, unless you happen to look. We always look for compounds, uh, worry about compounds that interfere with excretion. We always look at compounds that, that rate, increase rates of uptake into the blood, and we look for compounds that block metabolism, because when those compounds are present, it's impossible to figure out what the effects will be of other things that are there at the same time. Particularly when you've got things like acid salts, you've got organics, you've got PAHs to present, we've, we've created a, a, a very complicated problem. Um, one of the ways agents, things agents do is they compete with other binding sites, cadmium and zinc, for example. Cadmium is toxic because it blocks the uptake of zinc and puts it out of place. So what do you see, cadmium poisoning? No, you see zinc deficiency in the disease present. Um, it's probably uh, there's a way to build a clinical regime and deal with that, but not if you think you're looking for cadmium. The per solution is looking only for zinc. The, the problem is to get rid of the cadmium in some way. Um, Agents can change the physiologic distribution of a drug. Things that can't cross the blood-brain barrier, all of a sudden with certain solvents present, phthalates, for example, now allow other things into the blood brain that wouldn't be in there normally. So we could go and look at the in, in our textbook and say there's no neurotoxicity associated with this compound at all because nobody would have ever dreamed that you could put something in there to cause that agent to get into the brain. But, but it's there. So the interaction problem is gradually making us uh, more and more into it, the weeds, if you will. Um, the, the, uh, the agents that block excretion or elimination of drugs increase half-lives. That information actually does pretty good information on that because measuring half-lives are things that toxicologists like to do, and measuring half-lives of drugs are things that toxicologists like to do. In the presence, so we can actually identify what chemicals are doing that. Um, we don't know what they mean off, okay, often, but we can identify those those particular chemicals. What I'd like to do now is to, to in the little bit of time left to us, I'd like to uh, take a few chemical, a few of these agents out, and specifically talk about them. And it'll be a bit redundant because I've used them in a, before. Chemicals. I, I have. I chose twelve agents. I said. These are the 12 agents at the Marcellus Shale that worry me the most. Fine particle matter and diesel emissions is going to be one of them. Barium fluoride and arsenic will be another. Acetaldehyde, formaldehyde, the biocides and acrylamide we've already talked about, carbon monoxide, silica dust, volatile organic hydrocarbons, and radium. And finally, the chemical that we don't, I don't understand why it's there, what it's doing. Uh, is methylene chloride, which we have lots of exposure to. But let's start with fine particles, because I think that's the central part of the air exposure problem. Fine particles themselves are associated with asthma attacks. They're so associated with, with uh, problems, complications of, of, of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. So patients with those disease are going to react to the fine particles. Uh, they're associated with heart attacks. Now, fine particles are released by diesel and by, uh, by burning of various agents. Uh, if there's one emission source that's very high at the, on the, uh, in the gas extraction industry, it's diesel emissions. So we see extremely high diesel emissions. In fact, 
we have actually measured diesel emissions at houses near people, net measured the fine particles from diesels at houses and found them in the order of 60 to 80,000 present for periods of time. A very serious problem. And the reason is because fine particles, when they are put in the air, become hydrated like that. And then the, the, the water layer around the fine particle absorbs irritants, VOCs, and other things, anything water-soluble. And when that fine particle is inhaled, it is, not, it is so small, it is not stopped in the upper airway and goes directly to the deep lung. If there wasn't a fine particle there and somebody were exposed to acetaldehyde, it wouldn't be a big problem because it would just be absorbed in the fluids of the upper respiratory tract and we wouldn't see an effect. So fine particles are really a, a problem. And the size ranges that are present have two problems. One is some of them are very, very small, uh, and we've measured particles sizes in near this, these uh, sites. And there's very small particles, and there's also very relatively large particles that fall out on the ground. But particles that fall out on the ground are now available to be tracked into houses. So people can actually contaminate their houses by doing that. And at our, our uh, group actually asks people to do a very simple thing. We say, don't wear shoes in your house. Don't let anybody wear shoes in your house because you don't want to find particles tracked in because when you vacuum, they're going to go into the air and somebody will breathe them. Um, they, this synergistic effect was first observed in actually Denora, Pennsylvania during the Denora disaster. And the effect has been, was documented, it's been studied, it's well known. There's no doubt that there's a synergistic effect when you put fine particles in the air with other gases. The next chemical that I wanted to make a few, set of chemicals I want to make a few comments about is, uh, is our barium fluoride and arsenic. We'll start with arsenic. Arsenic, it, in fact, has, has two valence states. One is not very toxic at all. The other one is extremely toxic. So knowing that there's arsenic in the blood or in the urine is not as helpful, very helpful, unless you know what the arsenic valence state is and whether it's organic or inorganic. Those are very expensive studies to, to get. Uh, almost all of us carry arsenic, particularly if we eat a lot of fish, because there's a lot of arsenic in fish, but it's not a particularly toxic form of it. So arsenic is a compound that, that has a particular kind of an effect, a particular kind of, ex, uh, of exposure. Um, it attacks, it binds sulfhydryl groups in the body, and it, and it, and it attacks cellular metabolism. So we know actually how arsenic works, and we know what the effects that we would see from arsenic. Uh, fluorides are direct cellular poisons. Fluoride is probably the most worrisome compound that I saw when I began to look at the toxicity of this agent, of these agents. Fluoride is a halogen. It is the most potent of the halogens, and it gets into the, if it gets onto the skin or the body, into the skin, it breaks down slowly, and it will burn right to the bone. And, and so we'll, people will see dermatology ulcerations and that will just not stop because uh, the typical treatments don't work. On the other hand, some elements of fluoride are not very toxic at all, depending on the solubility of the compound. Fluoride is a very difficult chemical, and just identifying fluorides there or using fluorides is, is a problem. Now, the reason that people would want to use fluorides is because they want to to uh, produce changes in the shale so that the, so that the gas will come out. So there's a reason for fluoride to be there. Barium is strange, it was strange for me, because there's lots of barium present, I couldn't figure out why, and I couldn't, generally didn't care about barium, because I never saw anything but the, uh, the salts of barium, the uh, insoluble salts. But the soluble salts of barium operate, and they have dermatologic toxicity, they have cardiovascular toxicity, and if they're soluble salts, they're a, real, they're a real problem. We already talked about the acetaldehyde, and formaldehyde, there's not much more to be, to be said about that. We worry about the carcinogenicity, we worry about the alkylating and possibly skin sensitization response from those chemicals. I talked in some de detail about the biocides and the acrylamide. Both chemicals are, both those 
kind of that class, that category tends to suggest that there's unusual things that are present that we don't understand very much about. I'd like to go to the, back to the, to the adamantine chemical that we talked about very far back. Adamantine is a strange structure. It's a chair structure. Now, when I was at Cornell and studying chemistry, I don't even think that, and it was a, it's a good chemistry department, I don't think they spent more than 45 minutes explaining chair structures to me. And I never, and I was pleased that they didn't because it was very boring. Anyway, but it wasn't until I got back and began looking at why things are particularly structurally a problem in the body and what retains them in the body that I realized that things with high tertiary structure, dioxin is toxic because it has a strong tertiary structure. It doesn't, there's no real way for it, be, to, for it to be metabolized. The chair structure compounds are equally difficult. There is, when we looked, we could find no toxicology on them. There was some evidence that they had been used in, in some drug treatments at, at, at some point. The first the structure, they were invented in Germany in the mid-1930s. They weren't invented, but they appeared. Okay, we talked about carbon monoxide a bit. Carbon monoxide has well-known actions. It does what it does. It has neurological actions in addition to people who are episodically exposed will have effects from carbon monoxide exposure that are neurological and they're not treatable. So, so episodic exposures to high levels of carbon monoxide, particularly in children, are something that should raise concern. Silica dust. Silica dust is a very dangerous agent. In, in, in industry, it's very highly controlled. It's inhaled, it goes to the deep lung. What it causes in the deep lung, deep lung is releases of lysosome, which, which initiate uh, a, a scarring response that once it starts is progressive and go, will go on for several, several years. Uh, there is no information on what would, exposure of a child to this, but there, we know that there's silica in the air and silica released along the streets in, Pens in Pennsylvania. I already talked about the volatile organic hydrocarbons, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, and benzene, xylene, toluene. That data should be pretty easy. It's, it's in the literature, we know what it does, so I won't, don't want to spend much time, any more time on that. The last two compounds is radium. Radium is referred to as, as uh, naturally occurring radioactive material. That's unfortunate, because it's naturally occurring radioactive material doesn't mean it's not toxic. It is very toxic, and it is released from the Marcellus Shale, it's from the Davinian period, it is very old radium. No one has ever looked at this study of radium that has decayed down 500 million years. Which, but that's what we're looking at when releasing here. It can, it, because it's water soluble, it will appear in aerosols. So if we vent machines that vent water, we can have radium in it so people can be inhaling it. So there's actually an air, water, and soil pathway. The last chemical is methylene chloride. Methylene chloride is a, is a paint stripper. You read the bottle, it'll tell you what it does. It's, but this appear, appears is the second most frequently uh, compound appearing in the water, in the air, or around these sites. And it, uh, we don't, I don't know why it's there. Some methylene chloride actually must come out of the produced water. Some of it appears to be part of the use system that they're using within the, within the area. But met methylene chloride is a CNS depressant. But what it does is it opposes, in, when it's warmed, it decomposes to phosgene, a really toxic chemical. Um, and it is, it is converted in the body and is breakdown to carbon monoxide. So it's another source of carbon monoxide. In fact, you can measure the carboxyhemoglobin, find in the literature, the carboxyhemoglobin levels go up in people exposed to methylene chloride. Uh, it, and epidemiology studies link it to reproductive effects in, in workers. Well, in summary, the toxicology of the uh, Marcellus shale is complicated. It's complex, but it's not really complicated. What we do is to follow a certain systematic process. We find the target organ. We, we identify what that target organ is doing. We go in the literature and try to understand what injury to that target organ would tend to, to appear.
we uh, get a little bit upset when we see things interacting with each other, but we're not too upset about it because we realize how the interactions occur. I tell students, there aren't a thousand things going on. There's about 15. And if we were gonna go down and write down everything that I've talked about, you would be hard pressed to get much beyond 15 pieces. So, so a problem that may look really complicated and is complicated and is important is not going to be something that we can't understand. But we need to have some guidance as to where we're gonna look. I, I always start my guidance looking at this book and then I'll confess, then I find the oldest toxicology book I can find. Because the people who wrote those old toxicology books came from the original atomic energy researchers during the development of the, the uh, atom bomb. And their job was to make sure people were safe. They took their skill and applied it to industry and then they wrote out what you needed to do. It's often the very best place to look. Um, I'd be happy to handle any questions. One of the things that uh, we see as clinicians are people presenting with symptoms. And when we have uh, patients who are living in areas where there is natural gas extraction actively happening, we're going to have in our waiting room individuals who have coughs and colds from viruses and other conditions. Uh, we often write differential diagnoses about what could be causing this. How do we as clinicians in an area where there's active gas drilling have a high level of suspicion that a particular patient presenting is in fact presenting with a toxic exposure? Um, it's a really tough question, <laughs> but that's a good question. What we've been doing is to actually interview and and have a nurse practitioner look at patients. And, and, uh, and as that pro work has progressed over the last year, and as we've looked at other work, we haven't come up with a shale gas definition, but we've come up with things that appear to be more frequent in the shale gas area than the other. One of the things we find is this nosebleeds. And, and uh, nosebleeds for which no one has an idea what's going on, um, and I think that in some cases physicians could be helpful because I think in some cases they have to be worked up. The other thing that, that the GI, somebody comes in with stomach problems again and again and again. Um, if you're drinking water that contains ions, you will have uh, things like fluoride and stuff, you will have severe abdominal distress. Uh, it actually, those, the uh, fluoride interferes with the uh, with the plexus the, of the uh, of the um, in that controls peristalsis, so it's not unusual to see those effects. In fact, if you want to, you can go all the way back to the early lead literature, and if you read the lead literature, the 30s and 40s, they always talk about uh, colic, and it was simply because lead was interfering with the uh, with the the, the uh, neurological system in the gut. Um, how what would I look for? I would probably take that list that ATSDR came up with of GI, sensory, whatever, and if I looked at one of those and I knew the patient was living near a gas extraction process, I'd probably ask the question, what could they be exposed and what would it be? Would I go and start doing, uh, looking for a surrogate chemical in the urine or the blood? Not a clinician, so I don't know. I would be a little, um, you'd have to be pretty cagey to get the right one. <laughs> many of our patients uh, these days are taking medications, perhaps too many of our patients are. How, does that have any effect on the way that we handle uh, toxic substances? I, I wish I'd, thank you for asking that question, I wish I'd included it. Yeah, it does. Uh, if, you, if you have a patient who's titrated, something uh, for a blood pressure medication or that, and you introduce things that interfere with the uptake and distribution, I think we could find certain of those patients to be less stable because they're, they're, the metabolism of the drug is being interfered with. So I think we should really worry about that. If we're taking something that already produces some sort of a mood change, or we should worry about that because of the, particularly the, the organic solvents, those short chain organic solvents would interfere in those areas. 
it might just be that we'll find that people are having difficulty managing their disease, which may be part of the clue as to what's going on. Um, irrespective of that, I think you should counsel patients to get do take actions that would reduce their exposures. Do not wait for the state or the federal government or even researchers and universities to, to figure out what's going on. Stop the exposure. As a physician, uh, when I come across particular infectious diseases, I'm obliged to report them to public health agencies. If I'm working in an area where there is a shale gas extraction or another extraction industry, and I see uh, a case that looks fairly transparently uh, to have been caused by some exposure, is there any way that I can report this? Um, you can always report it to the health department. Depending on the state you're in, you'll get different responses. I hate to say that. Um, usually what health departments do, if they get three reports of a similar thing, which is really how West Nile virus was identified, mm -hmm. they got three reports of Russian men having some virus. And uh, if you're in a department like the city of New York, somebody will go out and immediately realize there's something going on. And then they'll talk to people at the Bronx Zoo and realize it's a virus that came from Africa. But uh, those are outbreak investigations. So what you would like to do is trigger an outbreak investigation. You might try sending it to state health departments. You might try sending it to the CDC. And uh, if uh, you're fortunate or somebody would look at it and would it identify, uh, the nosebleeds fall into that category. There's 20% of what we're seeing or more people are reporting that they have nosebleeds. I can't think of any other population you'd go to and just pick out and find 20% of people having nosebleeds. 